So we're doing this series in 1 Samuel. Uh, that's the book that we're in. So if you've got a Bible, you can open that up. If you've got a device with the Bible app on it, pull that out. Um, 1 Samuel 24 this morning. Laura Eads is going to come and read the passage for us. Thank you, Laura. First Samuel chapter 24, David spares Saul's life. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said, To you I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My Lord the King. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, why do you listen when my men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay a hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but I did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds so my hand will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing, a dead dog, a flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So David gave his oath to Saul. Then Saul returned home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. Great, thanks Laura. <clears throat> so our, our passage this morning takes us to this, this little spot on the globe called En Gedi. En Gedi. In the first verse of the chapter, we read that David went up to En Gedi. Uh, and En Gedi is a place that a group of us from shore visited back in 2014 when we went to Israel. We did a tour of Israel, and En Gedi is the spot kind of down in the southern part of Israel It's a very barren, desert, arid, inhospitable kind of environment. It's just brown rock as far as you can see. 
Uh, but in in Giddy or near in Giddy is the Dead Sea. And so when we were in En Giddy, we went swimming in the Dead Sea, which is a great experience. This is, it's about the, you can, there's a few familiar faces there. You might notice some people, might recognize some people. Uh, this is the lowest point on earth uh, in Giddy, near the Dead Sea, uh, about 480 meters below sea level. And so the Dead Sea, the, the salt content is so high that you just float on top of the water. So you, even if you try and push your body down, you just bob back up like a beach ball. It's great. You could read a book like while you're floating on the water in the Dead Sea. So this is what we did <laughs> in En Gedi. It's probably slightly different to what David did when he was there. But we had a great time frolicking around in the Dead Sea. But the whole environment around that area is very dry. It's, it's very much a desert kind of environment. But the interesting thing about in Gedi in particular, is in the middle of this desert, you have these little oasis areas. I think you see one if you go to the next slide, uh, Nathan. So you see, like, this is the same area, very close to the Dead Sea, and you can see all this desert rock there, but then you've got these lush green areas. You've got these really fertile areas, and there's a natural spring not far from the Dead Sea. You've got water there that you can drink, and it forms a, a waterfall, and there's a, there's a pool there that you can swim in. And so it's a real juxtaposition of this dry, arid, barren desert, and then these, these lush, green, oasis-type areas. It's a real contrast, uh, and you can start to see why this made such a good hideout for David. Like he spent a lot of time while he was on the run from Saul in this place, in Gedi. Uh, he spent some significant time there. This was his home while he was a fugitive and he was being hunted by the king. Uh, he made his home in En Gedi. And on the one hand, I mean, this is a pretty inhospitable environment. No one really wants to live there, but that made it hard for Saul to pursue him, right? So this makes it hard for Saul to take an army into this kind of place and live there, sustain them there for any length of time. So it's not easy to pursue David in this kind of area. But at the same time, David's got fresh water to drink. There would have been animals around that he could kill for food. Uh, and there were these caves. If you go to the next slide, these are the sorts of caves that you find in, in Gedi. And it's probably a cave like that that David was hiding in when we come to the story that we're looking at this morning. So lots of good hiding places in En Gedi. So as the story starts, David's in En Gedi. King Saul hears about this, that da that's where David's hiding. And so we read in verse 2, Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David. Just think about that for a minute. Saul's going with an army of 3,000 soldiers. So a few chapters earlier, we read that Saul's entire army is only 3,000 people. So basically, Saul's taken the entire army of Israel and is pursuing this one guy. Saul's like deployed the entire defense force of Israel. He's taken them in this wilderness excursion to hunt down this one solitary individual who actually poses no threat to Saul whatsoever. You can kind of see how paranoid Saul's become. Can you see how erratic his behavior is that it's like, Forget defending Israel for a minute. Forget fighting the Philistines. We're going to take the whole army and we're going to go in the desert and we're going to pursue this one guy in his 20s who's not actually trying to kill me at all. Like Saul is really disconnected from reality at this point. But nevertheless, this is what he does. So he takes the army. He's got 3,000 soldiers that he has to try and feed and water in the desert. He goes to En Gedi. And there we come to verse 3. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there. And Saul went in to relieve himself. Now, because I know you're really interested in the details of the Hebrew text, I'm going to tell you that the words relieve himself literally in Hebrew uh, mean to cover the feet. To cover the feet. Let your minds wander with that one. But that's basically a euphemism for going to the bathroom. I just thought you'd like to know. A little bit of biblical... <laughs> A little bit of biblical exegesis. So that's basically a euphemism for going to the bathroom because Saul had the same biology as the rest of us. And so even when you're in the desert, when you've got to go, you've got to go. So he had to go. And so, you know, there's a lot of caves around and Saul decided this is what I'm going to do. So he ducked into a cave. Uh, and then what we're told, that what the narrator tells us that Saul didn't know is that further back in the same cave was David and his men, and they couldn't believe their luck because Saul goes into the cave. I mean, because, because of the business that Saul had to do, he would have gone into the cave by himself, 
So not even his bodyguards would have accompanied him in here. He would have taken off his, his weapons, his sword, he, that spear that Saul's always holding. He would have put that on the ground. And so he's at his most vulnerable now. He's at his most defenseless. He's a solitary individual. And David and his men are back in the dark recesses of this cave. And so David's men start getting excited about this. And they start saying to David, this is the day the Lord has made. This is the day that God's delivered your enemies into your hands. Look at what's happened, David. Look, I mean, what are the coincidences? What's the chances of this happening? Like the very cave that we're hiding in. And here's Saul. Like, obviously, this is God delivering Saul into your hand. Obviously, this is like God's just put him here, David. Now, why don't you just take him out? Like with one blow, one stab, you could take this guy's life, David. Just do it. You don't have to deal with a whole army. Just take Saul out. Probably the rest of the soldiers will either run or defect at that stage. So just go. Just take him now. Now's the time. They're egging him on. They're trying to convince him. They're trying to cajole David to just go and take Saul's life. And David's not sure. You can kind of hear him oscillating. He's not sure what to do. He's, does, he's trying to figure out, is this, is this really... God giving me this opportunity? Is this something else? Is this more of a test? Like David's trying to figure this out. So rather than kill Saul, he goes up and he does this. Uh, end of verse 4. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now why does David just cut off a little corner? Of Saul's robe. What I mean, this is not really going to change the battle. It's not doing any harm to Saul. Saul didn't even like he, he'd taken probably Saul had taken his robe off. So this is not doing him any harm. He doesn't even notice what's going on here. Well, that word corner in the Hebrew is the word kanash, and it literally refers to the hem of a garment or the tassel of a garment, the very outer skirting of, of a garment. And in the ancient Middle East, when somebody cut off the corner or the hem of a robe, it would signify taking that person's honor. It would symbolize, it was a symbolic act. If you cut a piece of somebody's robe, it would symbolize you taking their authority, taking their status, taking their identity, taking their honor in some way. There are records of uh, married men in the ancient world who, when they divorced their wives, they would cut a piece of their wife's robe off. And it was a symbolic way of saying, you are no longer a married woman. So it was a way of basically taking away that woman's marital status, which was basically taking away her social status. And so when you think about Saul, the king, well, he would have had a very ornate robe. It would have been a, a big, very regal robe, maybe purple. Uh, this would have been a very fancy robe. And so for David to come and cut the corner of Saul's robe, what's he doing? What's he symbolizing? This is David taking Saul's honor. This is symbolically, this is David saying, I'm going to take the king's honor for myself. I'm going to take his status as king. I'm going to take his authority as king. I'm going to take his position. David's basically taking the throne. It's like symbolically David is taking the kingship away from Saul. He's saying, you are no longer going to be the king. I'm going to be the king now. And he's taking this for himself. He's taking Saul's position for him. He's taking the throne from Saul to himself. That's what's being symbolized in this text. And as soon as David does that, look what happens, verse 5. Afterward, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord's. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men. So that, the word sharply rebuked, it literally means to tear into. So David tore into his men. It's like a little wordplay here. Having torn a corner of Saul's robe, David now tears into his men. And he rebukes, he, he gets angry at these guys. Because that egged him on. And they'd convinced him to do this thing. Well, they wanted him to do more. They wanted him to kill Saul. But David now realizes this was wrong. This was not God's will. This was not what God wanted him to do. It wasn't his place to do this. God, Saul's still on the throne. He is still the king. This is God's deal. This is for God to deal with in God's way. And David recognizes this is not what God has wanted for him. And so he has some very stern words to his men. 
and they're prevented from laying a hand on Saul. Saul finishes his business. He gets up, puts his robe back on, and he goes on his way, never realizing what's happened, never realizing how close he came to death. David does have a conversation with him later where he realizes this, but at the time, Saul just goes on his merry way. I think in a lot of ways, you can, you can understand where David's men were coming from. You know, you can understand like why David wanted to do this. You can understand the desire to do what he did. I mean, David's been promised the kingship, right? David's been given this promise by God that he is going to become the king. He is going to sit on the throne. That's been promised. He knows that's coming. He knows that's coming in his future, and he knows that Saul's been rejected by God as the king. So Saul's already been discredited. David knows it's only a matter of time before he comes to the throne. So really, all he's wanting to do is just kind of speed up the process. You know, all he's really wanting to do, it's like, well, this is already my destiny, God. I just want to take it into my own hands. You know, I know this is coming for me. I'm just going to fulfill the promise right now. I'm going to take it. And the point of the story, of course, is not that God didn't want David to become king. It's that this wasn't yet David's time. That's the point. Yes, God had this destiny for David. Yes, God had ordained David to be king. But this wasn't yet his time. And in the wisdom of God, and we don't know exactly why, God still had another five or ten years before David was going to take the throne. God could have put David on the throne earlier. God could have put David on the throne right now. But in God's providence, that's not his time. God still had more wilderness years to work out in David's life because he's preparing David. He's forming something in David. He's shaping something in David that will make David the kind of king that, Saul, that God wants him to become eventually. This was not yet David's time. And so what this text really shows us is David taking God's timing in his own hands rather than trusting God to work out God's time frame in his way and in his time. Does that sound familiar to anybody? All right, can we relate to this at all? You know, this is, like, this is all of us, right? This is a struggle we all have at times. How many times do we want to try and take God's timing away from him and try and impose our time frame on situations in our lives. David had to learn to wait on God to bring him to the throne rather than just taking this for himself. But there are so many parallels, I think, in this story to our culture and to our lives today. I know we're, we're separated from David by a lot of years and a huge cultural distance. And yet at the same time, this I think speaks straight into our lives, speaks straight into our cultural context today. I mean, just imagine, just imagine David sitting in this cave with a, uh, with a life improvement coach. You know, like imagine David sitting there and he's got like a self-help YouTube influencer there telling him how to live his best life. You know, and David says, look, I've got this opportunity here to take Saul out. I've got this opportunity to at least symbolically take a corner of his robe. I can take the kingdom for myself. What do you think I should do? Now, any self-help, lifestyle improvement, guru, influencer, YouTube person is going to say, David, you've got to take this into your own hands. David, you should take it right now. This is your moment. David, if you want it, you should reach out and take it. You should grab it. David, you should fulfill your destiny. David, you should live your best life. Right now, you should manifest your destiny, David. Speak it out. Speak it out to the universe, and the universe will return it to you. You know, like this is the kind of thinking that our culture conditions us with today that if you want it, you take it. You know, like our culture kind of wants us to be like David in the sense of if you want something, you take it. And don't worry about the time frame, and don't worry about other people, and don't worry about what God may want. Put that to the back of your mind. If you want something, you take it, you grab it, you grasp it, you own it, you clutch it, you make it yours. And let me say, like, there's, all, there's always a grain of truth in this stuff, right? There's always a nugget of truth in this stuff. I'm all for setting goals. I'm all for, yeah, you can have a great dream, and, and we can move forward, and we step in faith, and all of those things. The problem is, so much of this thinking comes out of a view of the human person that says, I am the captain of my fate. I am the master of my soul. And those are not my words, by the way. That was uh, William Ernest Henley in the 19th century wrote those. I am the captain of my fate. I'm the master of my own soul. And Western culture is drunk at that well so deeply. 
and just absorb this way of thinking about ourselves, that I am the king of my own castle and I am the center of my own universe. We have this view of the self where everything revolves around us now. It's an egocentric existence. I'm at the center of the universe. Everyone and everything else revolves around me. It's about my life. It's about my goals. It's about my dreams. It's about my plans. And my calling in life is to kind of look inside myself deeply, figure out my identity, and then self-actualize my potential in a way that everyone else sees how awesome I am and gives me the fame that I deserve. That's basically the script for the life that we are handed in Western culture, that if we want something, we go after it, and all that matters is our own desires, our plans, our dreams, our time frame, and our agenda. And that way of living, that way of thinking about ourselves is fundamentally incompatible with the gospel. It just runs against the way in which Scripture describes who we are as people. It runs against the way that God's called us to live. It runs against what it means to live in the way of Jesus. So when a person comes to Christ and gives their life to him, that is a, that is a moment of saying, God, my life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. And my life belongs to you. No matter what my culture may tell me, no matter what my world may tell me, my life is, does not belong to me. It is yours. You've purchased my life on the cross. And I'm handing my life back to you. That is the process of becoming a Christian. That's what it means to surrender your life to God. It is to say, God, I lay down my life to you. I give up my thoughts, my dreams, my hopes, my plans. It's not all about what I want to do and when I want to do it, but God, I surrender all that to you and I lay all that down and I give that up and I want to be crucified to my own life and I want it to be Christ who is living out his life through me. And the problem is I think a lot of Christians start there. We start with that moment of surrender. God, I lay my life down and then we spend the rest of our lives trying to take it back. The rest of our lives trying to take back this little bit of control. But I really want to control the timing of this, God. And I really want things to happen now. And I really want this to happen. And I'm really upset that this isn't happening. And I need control over this particular area of my life. And we want to take back and take back and take back. And that is why God leads us into seasons of life sometimes where we are forced to slow down and we are forced to wait on him. That's what God's doing in David's life. He's slowing David down so that David can't just have what he wants right now and can't just force the timing and force God's hand and force God's agenda. He has to slow down and he has to learn this really hard discipline and practice of waiting, waiting on God's timing, waiting on God to bring him to the throne. It's a hard thing to do. I think this is possibly one of the hardest spiritual practices of the Christian life, learning to wait, learning to wait on God because Sometimes, let's be honest, God just doesn't move fast enough. You know, like if God just worked as fast as we want him to, we wouldn't have this problem. If God just figured out my time frame and we just got in step, then we wouldn't have all these issues. But sometimes God just does not come through fast enough. You know, like some of you know this and some of you are right in this, in this space at the moment. I mean, you may be in a place in your career where you think, I don't, know, I don't understand how I'm the age that I am and I haven't moved as far as I thought I'd move in my career. You know, some of you in that space where you get to a certain point, you're like, how in the world have I gotten to this point? I thought I'd be 10 steps further along in my career than I am now. How have I not made the progress that I thought I'd made? I see other colleagues in the industry who have gotten all sorts of advancements and opportunities and achievements and reputation, and I'm back here. That's, that's a very hard place to be. Some of you have wanted to see far more progress in your careers than you've seen at this point. Some of you may be unemployed and you're looking for a job and that's not happening as fast as you thought it would happen. And you're, and you're praying all the right prayers. You know, this is the hard thing, isn't it? You pray the prayers and you're reading your Bible and you're like, God, I'm doing my part. So how come you're not keeping your end of the deal? You're praying and you're applying and you're getting the interviews, and, but it's just not happening. Those are hard experiences. Maybe you're trying to sell a house. Maybe you're trying to buy a house. Maybe you're trying to have children and it's just not happening. And you're like, God, What's going on? I'm praying. I'm doing the right things. I'm trying to live a good Christian life. I see other people that are getting these things. They don't even follow you. 
I see other people that are getting all sorts of things in their life that I want, and that, 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 that they're not even worshiping you, God. I'm trying to do my best here, and yet you're not coming through for me. That's a very hard space to be in. But it's in those seasons where God says to us, now I'm going to teach you what it means to wait on me. I'm going to teach you this really hard, uncomfortable practice of learning to slow down and to wait on me. And, and waiting on God is not often what we think it is. You know, like we hear waiting and we think of something really passive. Waiting on God is not a passive thing. It's not just doing nothing. Waiting on God is not just sitting there, hands folded, like, well, God, you know, you just do your thing and I can't do anything. You know, like waiting on God doesn't mean just not applying for jobs. And waiting on God is not, by the way, an excuse for laziness. Sometimes we, you know, like if you say, well, I, I haven't received a promotion in 10 years, but hey, I'm just waiting on God. It may be that that's not waiting. That's just underperforming in your job. You know, that might be the issue that you're dealing with there. So don't, don't over-spiritualize stuff that maybe is just, there's other factors at play. Waiting on God is not passive. Of course you can move forward. God's given you a brain. He's given you his Holy Spirit. Yes, apply for the jobs. Yes, go to the open homes. Yes, put your house on the market. Yeah, you step forward and you move and, and knock on those doors and, and, you, and you keep moving. But waiting is more a posture of the heart where we say, in the midst of all this, God, I want to focus on what you're doing in the waiting. I want to focus on what you're doing in my life, in this time. So my focus is not just going to be all on like what's not happening yet and why isn't it going fast enough and what I'm missing out on and all this. My focus, God, is going to be like, what are you doing now in me and what might you be forming in me? Isn't that what God was doing in David's life? Where do you think the Psalms came from? Not from someone getting everything he wanted as fast as he wanted it. So many come out of anguish and frustration and waiting. But God was shaping David so that by the time he got to the throne, he was a king who trusted the Lord with all his heart and didn't try and take everything into his own hands. I mean, we know he still made some pretty spectacular failures. But God was still preparing David through these wilderness years. And in those wilderness seasons, when you're forced to wait, God is doing something in you. But the irony is, it's always those seasons we want to get out of the quickest that God's doing his best work in. We're so desperate to get through it and over it and past it and out of it. And God's like, but I'm working in it. I'm doing something in the waiting. I'm doing something in this season. So become attentive to what the Spirit of God might be doing in the waiting, in that season, rather than becoming like David who's pushing and forcing and trying to cajole and manipulate and construct something for himself. What's God doing in the waiting? There's a family in our church who uh, a few years ago decided that they wanted to adopt a child uh, into their family, a child who had no family of their own from overseas. So they uh, signed up with an organization that connects New Zealand families with children overseas that don't have parents. Either the parents have been killed or they've abandoned their children or whatever. So they, they signed up through this organization. And that's now been a three-year journey for them, longer than they thought it was going to be. And this is a real journey of waiting for them. Uh, there was a point not too long ago where they came really close and it looked like it was going to happen. And there was a child that looked like it was, it was a match for their family. Uh, and they were getting ready and they were kind of emotionally prepared for this. And then very late in the piece, they found out that it wasn't going to happen. And it all kind of crumbled down and, uh, and they, they weren't able to take that child. And that was so hard for them. And it was such a grief and such, a, such an agonizing point in their journey and really hard to come to terms with. And so at this point, they're still waiting and they're still trusting and they're still hoping. And it's still really hard. It's a hard journey. One of the family members said to me this week that um, if she's doing well, she can go about a week of trusting God without starting to grasp it for herself again. You know, like, that's an honest heart, isn't it? You know, just that desire like, to try and force the time frame somehow, try and, even though they can't really, try and influence it somehow, try and push and force it. But God's doing a work in that family at the moment. And they can look back and they can see now a little more clearly how it hasn't been the right time up to this point. 
and they can see the way that God's leading them through this process of surrender, that God's teaching them to really hand this journey over to him and hand their hopes and dreams for a child, an adopted child, over to God and, and to trust him and to then keep surrender, to re-surrender each day to the Lord. They can see now a little bit more clearly this work that God is doing. He's teaching them to trust. He's teaching them to wait on him. This is what God wants to tune you into if you're in that kind of season. What's he doing in the waiting? Let me mention a few things that God might be doing uh, in the waiting in your life. Number one, he might be teaching you patience. Maybe just good old-fashioned patience. Like that's a, that's a very uncommon virtue these days, isn't it? Because we want everything and we want it right now. Uh, and I think this is really true in our spiritual lives, in our, in our walk of faith. Like we want really fast spiritual growth, don't we? And we want like six easy steps to a mature Christian faith. We want five quick steps to being a spiritual guru. And we want kind of to see this growth in our life. And I think God reminds us sometimes there's no shortcuts in the kingdom of heaven. There's no shortcuts to spiritual maturity. My favorite pastor, Eugene Peterson, he wrote a book called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. That's his definition of discipleship. It's not very glamorous, is it? You know, like that's, that doesn't sound thrilling. Who wants to sign up for that? Like we want to sign up for like an extraordinary adventure with God. I want to sign up to live an extraordinary, abundant Christian life. You know, that's the kind of triumphalism we, we're attracted to. And yet the reality of discipleship is that it is a long obedience in the same direction. It's a steady walk with the Lord, putting into place spiritual disciplines that help to push our roots down deeper and deeper into the soil of His grace, the soil of His faith, so that we draw up the nourishment from the living water of the Holy Spirit. That's the journey of a lifetime. It doesn't happen quick. And so for some of you, you're frustrated with your lack of spiritual growth. Now, sometimes that can be because you're just not taking responsibility for your spiritual growth. But it may also be that the Lord is saying to you, one of the key ingredients in your walk with me is going to be time. It's going to be time. And you need to learn to wait on me to bring that growth, to bring that fruit, to bring that maturity in your life. You put good habits in place, good practices in place, and let God bring the fruit. So God may be teaching you patience. He may be, secondly, teaching you that there's something you need to let go of, perhaps. It might be that God's slowing you down because he's saying there's this thing, there's this area of your life that you've become too attached to, and I want to teach you to untangle your identity from that thing. Maybe you're too attached to your career. Maybe you're too attached to money and financial advancement. Maybe you're too attached in a particular area of something that you're really good at, particular area of competency for you, but it's become an idol. It's become something that your identity is caught up in, and God's saying, I've got you in this season of waiting because there's something that has become too important for you, and I want to teach you to let it go. I want to teach you to reprioritize that in my life, in your life. I want to teach you to seek first the kingdom of heaven and trust that all these things will be added to you. God knows what you need. He'll take care of that. But you seek first the kingdom. That may be why he's got you waiting right now, because he's teaching you, I want you to seek me. I want you to seek first the kingdom. And it may be that God's got you in a season of waiting because he's teaching you deeper trust and deeper faith. Isn't that what he was doing with David? Teaching David a deep faith and a deep trust. And God's teaching you, I want you to learn to truly look to me and depend fully and place the full weight of your life upon me and trust me with the timing and trust me with the outcome and, and trust me that I might not even give you the thing that you're waiting for. It might be something else and your life may go in a different direction, but I want you to deeply depend and rely on me. First Peter says, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up in due time. Those two words at the end of that verse are really important. In due time. Some of you feel like now's your due time. You know, some of you are like, I want you to lift me up now, Lord. You know, I've, I've done humble for long enough. I've been low for long enough. Now, God, I'm waiting for you to raise me up. But it may not be your due time yet. It wasn't David's due time in this passage. It wasn't yet. And you could say after years in the wilderness, surely it's overdue, but in the providence and the mind of God, it's not yet the due time. And it may be that God's saying, you humble yourself before me. You just put yourself in that place of humility and openness, teachability, and a heart that seeks after me like David, 
And you let me lift you up in due time. Don't try and establish yourself. You let God establish you. Don't try and lift yourself up. You let God lift you up in his due time. So I want to encourage you this morning, <clears throat> if you're in that season of waiting, to really become attentive to what God is doing in that space. Whatever you do, don't waste the waiting. Don't waste the waiting. You know, if you're in that place, I know it's uncomfortable. And I know it's, it's hard and it's full of anguish because you don't know how the story is going to end. It's not like David's story. We can flick on a few chapters and we see, oh, he did eventually become the king. In your story, you don't know where it's going. You don't know whether God's going to provide what you want ever or whether your story is going to go in a different direction. But my plea to you is that you don't want to look back on this season of your life and say, I just wasted those years in the wilderness and I never realized what God was doing because I was so focused on getting out of the desert and I was so focused on getting out of the wilderness and what was next and what was coming and what was future that I missed what God was doing in the present. You don't want to be that person. So tune in now and have enough openness of heart and humility of spirit to ask the Lord, what are you doing in the waiting? And make it in your life, not a passive waiting, but an active waiting. That's the paradox, isn't it, of the Christian life, that waiting on God is an active waiting, that while we wait, we worship, and while we wait, we seek Him, and while we wait, we ground ourselves in Scripture, and we allow God to, to develop the faith muscles in our life, because they are like muscles that need experience and work to be toned and built and strengthened. And maybe that's what God is doing in your life, saying, I want to develop those muscles of faith and trust in your life in this season. He's saying to you, I know that you think you trust me now, but in the waiting, I'm going to teach you what real faith is and what real trust is and what real dependence on me, my provision, my protection, my power looks like in your life. So don't waste the waiting but tune into what God is doing. Lean into that and allow him to work in your life, not just in the external circumstances that you're facing. So we finished this morning. I want to invite the band to come up on stage, um, start playing. And I want to lead you through a prayer as we end this morning. Uh, and this is it's not my prayer. It's a prayer from John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist movement, lived in the 18th century. And he wrote a prayer that I think sums up uh, what God is teaching David and us through this passage, this heart of waiting, really a, a heart of surrender, a heart of being willing to hand our lives over to God and say, God, whatever you want, make it happen in my life. Whatever, whatever that is, God, I'm yours fully and completely. That's the heart that this is coming out of. And it captures for me the essence of what God is saying to David in this passage. So I want to encourage you as I read this prayer to take this for yourself and make it your own prayer this morning. And so just be in, be in kind of a space, like even physically, where you just can receive this. You might want to close your eyes. Just shuffle back in your chair, get comfortable, relax, take a breath, and just let these words soak into your bones. And if they resonate with your heart, and again, don't, don't force it, don't push it. If this is not where you're at, okay, you, you pray your own prayer. But if these words connect to your heart this morning, then you turn them around and you offer them back as a prayer to the Lord, as an act of surrender to Him in this moment. So let's calm ourselves and quieten our hearts and make this our prayer to God as we prepare ourselves to take communion this morning. I am no longer my own but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. exalted for you or brought low for you. 
Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. God, we offer you these words as we offer you our hearts this morning. Just open and undone before you. God, even as we pray these prayers, we're so aware of our mixed motives and our own shadows that still want control, still get so frustrated or depressed because the things that we're wanting or dreaming of for ourselves may not be what you're wanting or dreaming of for us. But Lord, as best we can, we just surrender to you now. And we just say, God, teach us to wait. Teach us to be patient. Teach us to be surrendered. Teach us to trust.